Zip, zip, zip. Ok, pueden empezar, sí. Este. Ya podemos dar comienzo, disfruten, gracias. Pues bienvenidos, bienvenidos a todos, a todas, todos, a la mesa de museografía afro la resignificación de nuestros espaciales ancestrales. Vamos a hacer esto un poquito en español y también un poquito en inglés. Yo espero que todo el mundo esté bien con eso. Yo soy el moderador, uh, Omar Guito Martínez. Yo soy el vice, vicepresidente señor de sitios históricos para la Organización Nacional para la Preservación preservation historica in los Estados Unidos. My name is Omar Eaton Martinez. I'm the senior vice president of historic sites of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. También soy el presidente de la junta directiva de la Asociación de Museos Afroamericanos. I'm also the president of the board of directors for the Association of African American Museums. Y voy a decir que yo soy el primer puertorriqueño a ser presidente. tell everybody that I'm the first Puerto Rican to hold that position. Um, okay. A medida que el sector del patrimonio y matrimonio se esfuerza cada vez más por volverse más representativo de nuestras diversas audiencias y la importancia que tiene el patrimonio o matrimonio para la mayoría negra global, Exploramos el proceso de reinterpretar la relevancia dentro de nuestros sitios. Planeamos destacar proyectos e iniciativas que se están realizando a nivel local, nacional e internacional. La reinterpretación ayuda a informar la conciencia de la comunidad al abrazar la unidad de los afrodescendientes. Este trabajo desafía los supuestos racistas de la hegemonía al centrar la negritud en su interpretación, educación y preservación. Tiene un diseño pluralista e interdisciplinario para remediar contra el borrado y las narrativas falsas. As the heritage sector increasingly strives to become more representative of our diverse audiences, and the significance heritage holds for the global black majority, we explore the process of reinterpreting relevance within our sites. We plan to spotlight projects and initiatives being done locally, nationally, and internationally. The reinterpretation helps inform the conscience of the community by embracing the humanity of African descendants. This work challenges racist assumptions by the hegemony by centering blackness in their interpretation, education, and preservation. It is pluralistic and interdisciplinary by design to remedy against erasure and false narratives. Por favor, permítame presentarles a nuestros dos panelistas. Y voy a empezar con, con Juan Pablo Vizcaíno, que es el de Ancon Colectivo y miembro y descendiente de Lancón. I'm going to start by introducing our two panelists. I'm going to start with Juan Pablo Vicaino, who is a representative of El the collective El Ancón. He's a member and descendant. He's an artist. He's an activist. He's an artist and all these wonderful things. And so he's going to start off by giving a brief presentation about El Ancón. OK, he's going to go on, this, on the stage. He's going to command his. Um, Um, buenas tardes a todos. ¿Me escuchan? Sí. ¿Sí? Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Juan Pablo Vizcaíno Cortijo. Yo soy eh, parte de la familia de eh, Cortijo, el Ancón de Loíza. Eh, eh, el Ancón de Loíza era un pasaje 
que cruzaba a las personas, animales, trabajadores, de un lado a otro del río grande de Loíza, de Piñones a Loíza. También eh, ese pasaje es, eh, en tiempos pasados era la única comunicación que había entre el, el San Juan y el resto del este de la isla. En el, mil, en el 1920, mi bisabuelo compra la concesión del pasaje a la familia eh, Iturregui, que eran los dueños de los terrenos, y se convierte eh, en el primer miembro de la familia Cortijo en tener la responsabilidad de conectar a los residentes del pueblo y a los, los visitantes y luego turistas. Eh, la, el, luego, eh, los pasajes existían en todos los cuerpos de agua de Puerto Rico. En el mil nove, en, luego de la invasión estadounidense a Puerto Rico, como su, con su plan de infraestructura, comenzaron a construir puentes en los distintos ríos donde existían este tipo de pasajes, siendo el pueblo de Loíza el único que mantuvo este tipo de transportación, eh, ya sea por eh, casualidad o ya sea por simplemente que éramos un pueblo el cual no tenía tal vez un valor eh, económico, para, para pues, los, las personas que han desarrollado la isla. Y, pues, por lo tanto, el, ese pasaje se, 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 se convirtió en parte de nuestra, eh, eh, de nuestro, un símbolo del pueblo Loíza y una atracción la cual es, las personas eh, residentes, familias de la isla que nos visitaban, eh, visitantes de afuera, venían y, y disfrutaban de la del, 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 del viaje. Should I con, uh, say it in, in the English version? Sure. Yeah. So, um, uh, my name is Juan Pablo Vizcaíno Cortijo. Uh, I'm part of El Colectivo Lancón uh, de Loiza, which was a passage, a barge, that used to connect um, Loiza with the rest of the island. Um, in, in past times, In every, in most of the white rivers in Puerto Rico, they had this type of transportation to connect residents from one to another um, after the invasion of United States to the island in um, 1898. Uh, a part of the plan of infrastructure of, of, of uh, uh, the government of the United States was to build bridges across the island Uh, making this type of transportation disappear because um, uh, of the modern times and, and the idea to uh, make our country evolve with their plan. Um, being Loisa, the only barge that was maintained uh, that type of use, uh, and, and, and it, it happened into uh, in, in my family, my great grandfather. Uh, was the, in charge of this transportation uh, officially from 1920 and stay in my family into um, 1985, which, when the bridge was built. Oop. Oh, how do I pass this next one? There have to be another way to do this. No technician here. Oh, yeah, good, got it, thank you. Gracias. Um, uh, five years ago, uh, uh, our family Institute El Colentivo Ancon de Loiza. Um, it was a mission for us as a family and friends that united our, our effort to um, revive and, and, and give importance to the memory or such of a, a um, activity and such of a important um, a symbol to the town of Loiza. Um, that uh, that's our mission. Uh, with the closing of El Ancón in 1985 brought uh, a lot of uh, economical damage to the town 
of the majority of the people uh, will pass the bridge of Loiza and continue to Rio Grande and to other areas without uh, going inside our town and, and, and visiting and uh, buying, uh, going to our, our stores and fisheries. Uh, uh, it just disconnected. Once that bridge was built, disconnected. Um, the interactions within our visitors and, and the people of Loiza. It did a, a lot of economical damage, and our, our mission as a collective has been to um, bring that history back um, through uh, all uh, different sorts of activities that we're gonna uh, talk uh, soon. Um, pues el, el colectivo Lancón se instituye en el, eh, hace cinco años con la misión de rescatar eh, la memoria histórica y la, y la del pasaje de Lancón de Loiza. Y es lo que llevamos haciendo todos estos años a través de a, actividades y organización dentro de la comunidad, eh, eh, talleres y, y otro tipo de, de eventos. Aquí está la estructura del cierre de Lancón, como pues por los tiempos y el abandono, eh, se mantuvo por muchos años y pues ha sido nuestra misión reactivarla y lo hemos logrado. This is the a picture of the facilities um, a couple of years ago prior to our, our we organized as a, as a collective in order to bring back that memory and um, and and future events that and enrich back again the community of Loiza, the downtown of Loiza, if I could call it as as what a new way but kind of like as it was to bring that memory back to our people. Eh, estas son de nuevo las ruinas y el y el trabajo parte de nuestra comunidad trabajando en el espacio para reactivarlo, lo cual hemos hemos logrado. Eh, aquí están actividades eh, recogida de basura con los, las compañeras de Amigos del Mar, eh, personas que nos visitan, y en, la, en el trabajo de reconstrucción de nuestro espacio, el cual hoy opera eh, de, como un espacio multi, multi, multiusos. This is a part of the collective, the different collectives that, uh, and, and visitors, la colectiva Amigos del Mar, which are um, a collective that dedicate themselves to protect and, 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 and and react to um, uh, natural uh, uh, disasters, man-made disasters, and 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 um, uh, damage to our, our our beaches and our rivers and our communities by by you know bad um, uh, forms of construction, etc. Here's uh, another picture of our, the way we have uh, maintained our space now that is uh, done and, and working. Um, here's uh, kind of our merch, uh, which you help us to maintain our, our project running. Um, also some visitors, uh, Dilcia uh, Pagan, uh, the lady on your guy's left, uh, she's downstairs, no, Dilcia Pagan, no. Uh, Dilcia, I, no, this is not Dilcia Pagan. Uh, Dilcia, She's uh, uh, one of our, our members in the collective, is receiving visitors and showing her the space. Uh, and that's a painting that I did with my art um, a couple of years ago. And when I finished it, I presented it in front of the water, coincidentally, promise. And it just, you know, it was really, uh, it was there. Uh, Aquí estamos. This is a uh, workshops that we do uh, 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 during the pandemic, uh, activities that we did, uh, receiving groups and giving them workshop of bomba music. Um, also, we have uh, Ayuda Legal PR, which is a collective of attorneys uh, giving orientations about uh, protecting our, 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 our communities uh, about um, uh, 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 gentrification is that a word that I can use. Um, that's also our community kitchen, my mom and so for folks cooking 
uh, after uh, Hurricane um, uh, Fiona uh, and, and some efforts to help uh, uh, bring um, uh, in solidarity with the folks that uh, were uh, suffer flo floods in, uh, in our community. Um, este, uh, fotos del colectivo Ayuda a la PR, eh, gente que trabaja por apoyar nuestras comunidades y, y educarlos en respecto a eh, ser desplazados, talleres de música que damos en el espacio, en la, en la vuelta de Lancón, del patio de la, de la familia, y mi madre y otro compañero, María Luisa Cortijo, trabajando en el, ayudo, en el apoyo de Fiona Respond eh, por las inundaciones que hubo y la gente que fueron grandemente afectadas en el área de medianía en Loiza. Este es eh, otra de nuestras actividades, de nuevo repensando el espacio. Eh, este taller, esta actividad fue Afro Juventudes, que fue una actividad donde eh, Revista Étnica y el María Fon eh, identificaron a 50, 50 jóvenes afrodescendientes de la isla y les dieron un taller durante la pandemia, durante un año se les proveyó computadoras eh, para que ellos se pudieran conectar y se dieron todo tipo de talleres y, 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 y lecciones respecto a la descendencia, cerrando con un junte de ellos, eh, con un concierto de los cuales ellas, y, ellas organizaron en, en el patio, en las facilidades de Lancón. Um, this is a, a the closing of Afro Juventudes Festival, uh, a festival that was um, created by the youth that for uh, oh, around during the pandemic, over a year, uh, did um, um, virtual classes um, and had um, uh, the, the, the group that organized what Egnica and Maria Fon and provide computers to them so they could um, connect online. And uh, during that year, they took every type of classes of uh, our African inheritance and, and um, and politics within our, be, our, be, us being uh, black and, and, and uh, the, year, the ages were between 16 to 23, I believe. And um, uh, that was, this was the closing of the event uh, uh, of Afro Juventudes. Um, my purpose of showing this is uh, just showing you how a space that was hours of the community that it have such a big significance that for a year was abandoned because of um, the closing of, uh, of the Lancón as, a, as a, the barge as a system. Uh, uh, we give it that twist uh, collectively and brought it back to life in many different ways. We're growing, uh, we have a workshop of uh, su uh, sustainability of food we have activities that the youth can enjoy themselves in a safe space, inclusive. We have the fishery that is also activated uh, at this point, which used to exist also and disappear after the Lancon closed. We had uh, uh, activities to empower our community legally uh, in order to protect themselves from being displaced and many other activities that you know I could continue to mention, always with the open to inclusiveness and any, any, of, of any worship that will um, bring strength to our community and, and open um, arms to our different struggles and, 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 um, and uh, desire of, 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 of bringing the best we can to our island. Este, esta foto la, la, la demostré aquí y la enseñé con el fin de que veamos los espacios y los retomemos y le demos un resignificado, eh, siempre honrando la memoria de nuestros antepasados, de nuestros ancestros, pero con el fin de empoderar a la comunidad, decirle a nuestras comunidades que sí, que podemos, ¿no? que podemos lograr, eh, a, a, no importa los grandes retos que sean, y este, siempre con el tema de la inclusividad y de la... De la, de la Del, 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 de traerle beneficio a la comunidad de Loiseña y que la gente se, se sienta en un espacio seguro dentro del, dentro del pueblo de Loiza y haya esa, esa interacción también entre personas de afuera y que conozcan también nuestro pueblo y no lo vean como un pueblo eh, como se ha por años 
eh, presentado que nuestro pueblo es un pueblo eh, violento. Gracias. Dos fotitos más que se me quedaron. Aquí está la pescadería. Eh, aquí la, lo, uno de nuestros aliados políticos, el doctor Valgas Vidó, que está muy pendiente y apoyándonos en el proceso. Andrés Santos Ortiz, parte del colectivo junto a mí. Israel Díaz, Valgas Vidó, Israel Díaz, el que activó la pescadería que está abandonada y está preciosa. Si quieren pescado fresco, vayan a Loiza. Eh, yo, con la misma camisa que tengo puesta. <risa> Y Andrés Santos Ortiz. That's a Dr. Vargas Vidó, one of our um, uh, senators in the island. Uh, really uh, active and really in solidarity with all our causes. Uh, Israel Díaz, the director of the fishery, and a person that is like my father, he fish, uh, fishing, he support his family, came to the University of Puerto Rico and graduated in 1975 from the first school of marine biology of this university. Mm -hmm. That man right there, and without, he maintained his family fishing, came here, studied, and did the whole circle of life, retired, and after the pandemic and our efforts and asking and begging him to, he came and joined us and he activated the next phase. Uh, and Andres Santo Ortiz, which is our director of operation in El Ancón de Loiza. Andrés Santos Ortiz, nuestro director. Aquí también tenemos a Ana Irma, otra de nuestras senadoras, eh, compartiendo después de Fiona y viendo, ¿verdad? Haciéndole un scouting al área y conociendo nuestro espacio más desde adentro. This is our senador Ana Irma, um, uh, visiting our space and the fishery and seeing uh how 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 could she be helpful for us and our efforts to continue as also Polpi doing the nets where he fish i learned from him that i don't remember no more i was eight years old <laughs> i'll try to get back at it yeah and yeah this is the past and the present and the future of el Ancon de loisa my mom my brother my sister and our, our, our kids, which are the future of, uh, of Elanco, hopefully they uh, learn and, 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 you know, one of them pick up what we, uh, what my great grandfather started in 1920. Uh, Gracias, Juan Pablo, increíble. Um, allow me to introduce our second panelist, um, my coworker and colleague, Elon Cook Lee. She is the Director of Interpretation and Education in the Historic Sites Department of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Así que déjame presentarte a, a mi colega, Elon Cook Lee. Ella es Directora de Interpretación y Educación en el Departamento de Sitios Históricos en la Organización Nacional para la Preservación Histórica en los Estados Unidos. So, give her a round of applause. So, Elon, I know that you have a lot to share about the great work you're doing, and so I'm hoping that you can give the crowd a summary uh, around your work with RISE and SHINE, and what those, those are acronyms, so we'll explain what that means and how it's connected to descendant community engagement. As we heard from Juan Pablo, descendant community engaged work is the movement of today. It's been the movement for our people forever, right? But now we're starting to formalize protocols around this work. And so we're gonna, we're gonna ask that you talk about that. So por, por favor, denos uh, un resumen de Rise and Shine y cómo se relaciona con la participa participación de la comunidad descendiente. Elon Cookley. Hola. I'm going to speak in English because if I try to speak in Spanish, you will not understand me. <laughs> so um, thank you everyone for welcoming me here. I've had such an amazing time here uh, so far, and I'm excited about all the work that we're going to get to see and do tomorrow, um, visiting more sites around Puerto Rico. So um, just for 
anyone who hasn't heard of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, we have 27 historic sites all around mainland United States. They go as far north as Rhode Island and deep south to Virginia and um, Louisiana and then all the way across to California. Out of those 27 sites, 11 have histories of slavery and enslavement. And um, they, are, they also include some of the very earliest sites to join the National Trust portfolio. So a lot of the research that I do is um, in helping specifically with those sites, but also looking at the history of the National Trust and its work, why we have acquired the sites that we've acquired and maybe ignored other sites that would have been more inclusive of the full history of our country. And we do not, we'll say yet, have a site in Puerto Rico, but maybe sometime in the future. So um, Omar mentioned that he is the very first Puerto Rican to be the senior vice president at the National Trust or be a senior vice president at the National Trust. He's also the very first African descendant with that position. And I'm the first African descendant with my position too as um, director of interpretation and education. So it's... <laughs> So that also means that it's the very first time that a descendant of the international slave trade, of domestic slavery, of the experience of enslavement with African ancestors can be the one who is leading and making sure that our historic sites are using best practices in interpretation, not just through the perspectives of enslavers and colonizers, but of Africans and African descendants. So people who were born in the, um, what we now know of as the United States, who grew up having the combined experiences, the combined cultural memories of the peoples of Africa, of the, um, of the Americas, and of Europe. So the combining those experiences in their understandings of who they are and how they experience the world. A lot of the work that I do is, has really been with these 11 sites of enslavement because in many ways, these are the sites that children all across the country come to and maybe the only places that they learn about the history of slavery. There have been many studies in the last 30 or so years about how uncomfortable teachers and also a lot of parents are in talking about violent histories or explaining that these histories were violent and not happy and fun uh, places to go. So for me, um, as a child, as a descendant, and also as a mother and a future ancestor, I find it to be especially important that these sites are interpreted properly and using practices that are not just based on what we learn in academia, but also based on the needs of the communities, especially the communities made up of descendants. So um, in my position of uh, Director of Interpretation and Education, a lot of that is focused on storytelling, on research, and as I was um, talking with another participant earlier today, it's reimagining these places. It's recognizing that when you go to a historic place, the stories that you're hearing are an imagining of the past. It's taking the primary sources, it's taking the documentation, it's taking the photos, it's taking the bones. It's pulling everything together and creating a version of the past. And unfortunately, for the vast majority of cases in the United States, and I'm sure also here from what I've been hearing in Puerto Rico, that imagining of the past is still done through the perspectives, the experiences, and the needs of Europeans and European descendants. So the descendants of the colonists, the colonizers, and the enslavers. So that means that 
in order to do this work and do it using our more modern best practices, it must be done through the perspectives of the descendants of the enslaved, the descendants of those who had been colonized. So uh, starting in 2020, I created, I pulled together the leaders from the 11 historic sites with histories of slavery, and we created a group that we now called SHINE. So SHINE is really just an acronym meant to, um, meant to bring together our sites with histories of slavery and focus them around the need for reinterpretation and doing that reinterpretation in collaboration in equitable and ethical community with descendants of slavery and descendants of colonization. And then in 2021, I was part of the creation of an international version of this group called RISE. And RISE, Reinterpreting Sites of Enslavement, is done in collaboration with the International Trust Organization, which is based in England, but has hundreds of, of member sites all around the world. So SHINE is our 11 sites spread across the United States, and RISE is actually historic places in Europe, Africa, and the Caribbean, and the US, and we just got a site in Canada. Um, and we are hopefully going to be welcoming Puerto Rico into that group soon, as we know we definitely have some sites here. <laughs> so the purpose of these groups is um, to create a community. Um, at the moment, it's mostly virtual through Zoom, but to create a community for historic site staff so they can be learning these best practices, putting them actually into practice, sharing their experiences with each other. And um, in a lot of cases, it's become a safe place for them to talk to each other about some of the biggest challenges of working at sites of enslavement. These are places in the US, but also in a lot of other countries that have been, uh, uh, been under political attacks from uh, members of, in our case, definitely far-right media, um, different politicians, um, and community members who are uncomfortable with the truth about our history. So when we come together once a month, this is sometimes the only opportunity for folks to talk to one another about how challenging that can be and also come up with new strategies for how to address the, um, the constant push and pull within their communities and within our countries. So um, one of the first things that we came together around starting in 2020 was a rubric that was called, that is known as engaging descendants in the interpretation of slavery at historic sites. And it's available for free online and um, through the National Trust website and through the website for James Madison's Montpelier, which is one of our National Trust sites. This rubric helps to break down all the various ways that historic sites should be directly, ethically, and, um, and equitably engaging with descendants of slavery in the stewardship of the site, in the interpretation and storytelling of the site, and the actual staffing of the site. So the idea that um, a historic site with a history of slavery, a place that for much of its history would have been a majority black space, should have black people working there who are equitably paid for their time and their experiences, and should be part of the leadership of those places, whether that's you know um, high level positions within the staff as directors or CEOs, or um, on the board and serving in empowered positions on the board, not token positions, but in actual numbers that realize the power of their voices. So um, through that rubric, 
our sites have started to see some change. One of the most um, publicly known examples is at James Madison's Montpelier. So Montpelier, um, or James Madison was the third president, fourth president of the United States, and is also considered uh, one of the primary authors of the US Constitution. So this is someone who owned hundreds of enslaved people throughout his life and would have been surrounded by black people for much of his life. Um, their slavery is mentioned um, specifically and unspecifically in the Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. So it's been there, it's always been there, but has not always been properly addressed. So um, as of last summer, descendants became co-equal stewards of the historic site, James Madison's Montpelier. And that has helped, this is the first time in the United States that descendants of slavery have demanded co-equal stewardship and also received that. So it's something that we're very excited about and is a really interesting model for historic places to, uh, to other, other historic places to follow. So most of the work that we do through Rise and Shine is addressing the interpretation of these places and thinking through what are the expectations of visitors versus how we can actually meet or change those expectations going forward. So US sites, um, the mainland United States sites are for the most part places that visitors go to uh, for pleasure, for fun, for relaxation, just like places like in Puerto Rico where you might be, um, people might be going because they are jumping off of a cruise ship and they maybe wanna go do a rum tasting. So we have a lot that's similar um, in the United States. A lot of folks will tell you that they are coming to the site to learn about history, but when they are confronted with the truth of history, become very uncomfortable. Um, many people will listen politely, will absorb. Others will make inappropriate jokes or comments or push back in really ugly ways. So our staff have to be prepared for those various types of reactions, especially when they are working at sites that are telling the full truth of the history of the site. So that's been a lot of our work is um, exploring those best practices, putting them into practice, and then being supportive um, when you have these different kinds of reactions. So I think I'm gonna stop there, and then I'm excited for any kind of questions that coming from Omar and coming from you all about the work that we do. Thank you, Iman. Thank you for talking about our work. It's very exciting uh, to be able to participate in that work, but also make changes in our, in our sector, which are very, very much needed. Um, let me ask the first question to Juan Pablo. Um, yo me acuerdo en 2018 cuando yo vine a Puerto Rico a visitar con Sasha Antonelli y Mayra Santos Febres y ellas me llevaron a Bancón. En ese punto, el Bancón solamente era como un caparazón ¿verdad? de un edificio. Así que yo quiero saber cómo tomaste ese caparazón y la transformaste en este lugar de alegría negra cuando regresé con mi familia en, en 2021. So, in 2018, I came to meet with Sasha Antonetti and Mayra Santos Febres, and they took me to Alancón. And at that point, it was just a shell of a building. How do you take that shell and transform it into this place of black joy? And I came back with my family in 2021. Um, well, um, uh, it was it was something that we all wanted for a long, for the longest time, the whole family and the folks that have collect uh, work in. I work with with different collective or political groups and artists. They always had we always had that dream and desire, but it was just like, a, like an absurd, incredible challenge mm -hmm. economically to do it. Um, the decision was taken mostly because of how afraid we were of being taken down and build something else there mm -hmm. that will erase our history. Mm -hmm. So it was a decision taken like no matter what will cost we'll ha we had to do it 
And that's, that's kind of what we did, and we have transformed it in the process with the help of a lot of foundations and solidarity with our, with our cause and, and a lot of uh, man hours and woman hours, a lot of emails, a lot of hard work. And, and yeah, we're there little by little. Entonces, esa, a tu contestación, pues, eh, siempre tuvimos miedo, eh, terror, ¿no? De que tumbaran el espacio por el abandono para hacer, construir algo para que borrara, desapareciera una historia tan importante. Eh, y llegó el momento, dentro de muchos de esos miedos y terrores, que se acercaba a una realidad y pues tomamos una decisión que no importara el costo económico o de horas o de tiempo, pues lo íbamos a hacerlo y lo hicimos. Eh, claro, en el proceso ya como hemos ido fluyendo, hemos tenido mucho apoyo de distintas fundaciones, de apoyo económico y muchas horas de trabajo. Y yo aprendí, a, anoche fuimos a, a visitar la COPI. Ellos tienen como una historia similar, ¿verdad? Um, que ellos tomaron como 10 años para hacer todo eso. So, I visited COPI last night, or we did, and uh, they have a similar story where it took them, like, I guess, 10 years, according to Marty Cruz, and it was an activist movement, right? And I think that's important to understand that we don't, we don't wait for foundations and agencies. I work for the National Trust. We don't wait for that, right? We, we, we collaborate, we build coalition, and we do. And I think that's really important for us to lean on. And what I saw in El Ancon was what we call in the preservation world, re adaptive reuse, right? So they took an historic building that has clear connection to the history and culture of that community and they restored it and reinvented the use of that space, right? So it's a creative way of transforming the old building and really creating a new reuse out of it, a new, new thing with the galleries and, and, and the workshops and, and the, the, the restoration work with the mangroves that they do. So in el mundo de la conservación, esto se denomina reutilización adaptativa que es una forma creativa de transformar edificios antiguos o en desuso en espacios nuevos y funcionales. So that's really important that, you know, I see there's other opportunities in Puerto Rico para hacer eso también. Um, a mí me dijeron algo de un shopping center que queda cerca de aquí. There might be, a, so there's a shopping center that's close by that may be a good candidate for restoration and adaptive reuse. Um, and you know, those are the things that the National Trust and other like-minded organizations are very interested in. Y también yo quiero, yo quiero compartir que vamos, vamos a, a dar un premio nacional de conservación a Lancón. Right? So we are going to give a National Preservation Award. Right? I cannot think of a better group of people and community to lift up. I mean, it makes my heart super full to see that we have this opportunity to lift this narrative and this work and this labor for this, this storied community that we, we just, I get so much energy from, 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 from being around, around them. Um, and also, we found out that so in the National Trust, I am the Senior Vice President of Historic Sites. I raise money, but usually for just the sites that are part of the trust. Then I have at least two partners, uh, Brent Legs, who is the Executive Director of the African American um, Cultural Heritage Action Fund, and then Robert Ewing, who is the Preservation and Serv Services Outreach. He's the Senior Vice President for that. So they have their own external grant program. So with the African American, for the Action Fund, we found out on Thursday that they have also been invited to submit a full proposal uh, for a restoration pro project. So, ellos recibieron uh, una, un email, un correo electrónico de the African American Action Fund para submitir un, una, un propósito 
uh, para el proyecto capitales de restauración. So that's great. So these are questions for both you, Ilan, and uh, Juan Pablo, so Ilan, you can start. Um, so what have been some of the successes in creating these new alliances? Uh, what have been some of the barriers doing this work? So cuáles han sido algunos de los éxitos en la creación de estas nuevas alianzas? Y cuáles han sido algunas de las barreras para hacer este trabajo? Ilan. So of the, um, I think one of the biggest successes is last week. Um, so Omar and I helped organize a convening for descendants of historic sites with histories of slavery. So places like James Madison's Montpelier that I, I mentioned. Um, so plantation museums, historic houses, including urban historic sites, churches and other houses of worship, universities, historic institutions that employed either by renting or by owning enslaved peoples and you know privately owned places that owned enslaved peoples. So basically if you're a descendant and you can trace your ancestry to a place that is a currently publicly open historic place we um, tried to reach out and invite you to attend this national convening at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC. And we, through this process, we were able to get in contact with over 220 descendants from all across the United States. And of them, about 130 attended in person. And then we also had about 70 or 80 people logging in online to participate virtually. And it was an amazing experience to bring everybody together. And the purpose was education and networking and really the core one was empowerment. So helping folks to understand what, um, partially what Omar just mentioned of don't wait, start doing this work now and partially to help people understand that you have the right to access these places, you have the right to access the cemeteries where your ancestors were enslaved, the archives where your ancestors' bones are still kept, whether they're on display or not, that you have the right to have access to these things and to demand better be, um, be done by your ancestors. So that's in the interpretation, that's in the stewardship, and so bringing folks together um, to create opportunities for them to network and, and hopefully build a coalition, build a movement, because we recognize that no one can act alone. You must work in community if you wanna get anything done. Um, if you wanna get anything done with any kind of speed and efficiency, you must work together. So um, bringing everyone together was definitely the big success. Um, the barriers that we have faced have been the disconnection that a lot of descendants have had um, over the generations between themselves and historic sites. Uh, during the convening, we heard from descendants who had actually come together and purchased a historic home that they always thought was a really interesting place, but it wasn't confirmed until after they purchased the site that it was actually the home of their ancestors enslavers, and that the, um, some of the slave dwellings were actually still in the backyard um, on the property. So um, many times, you know, as the generations move forward to now, you lose track, you lose the connection, you lose the story that connects you to these historic places. So just history and the lack of documentation is, is a huge barrier. In other cases, it's the people who, it's the foundations or the individual owners. Um, sometimes it's the state, uh, the state um, organizing historic 
historical body that um, is the key barrier between descendants and engagement with these places. And so a lot of it is um, having to talk with the leaders of these places about the benefits of working with descendants, mm -hmm. that you should not be scared of working with descendants. There is nothing that you will lose and only what you can gain from working directly and equitably and ethically with descendants. So it's, it's helping folks get over the barriers that they often unintentionally put in place between themselves and this kind of engagement and finding what those barriers are and addressing them directly. I just want to lift up the name of our good friend Melanie Maldonado, who did represent Puerto Rico at, at the event uh, last week. And we are grateful for her to be there and talk to people about this because people are very ignorant of the history of, of Puerto Rico. And we have Melanie standing tall for us. So thank you, Melanie. Thank you. OK, so Juan, what have been some of the, the successes and some of the barriers? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> without, uh, uh, my sound cliche, but everything have been, uh, everything have been, uh, every movement, uh, every step have been, we're happy and grateful for it. Uh, from putting, uh, fixing a window, you know, a little shifting it so you can close it properly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a victor. That's a huge victory because you're trying to close that thing, you know, and <laughs> it never closed. And finally, you put a bolt, and it worked. And we're like, "Wow, we have we fixed the door." So, yeah. And challenges, that same thing. I mean, uh, you know, uh, this is a this is a country that is many many things are uh, uh, become more difficult. It just institutions like um, uh, government institutions or paperwork and things like that mm -hmm. is is challenging because it's, it's a little bit slower mm -hmm. because of the conditions of of the government government in general um, every government have their things and you go to the DMV anywhere in the United States and you're gonna suffer a couple of hours right so so it, it translates uh, to our institutions here in the country uh, and yeah, uh, but um, I just, I can, every workshop that we do is a victory. Every, uh, the education within the community is a victory. Seeing the people implement in their, in their, in their back of the yard while they are learning now in their, in their uh, food sustainability workshop right. is a victory. Right. Uh, wanting to protect their community and protect their houses instead of thinking, wow, if somebody offered me $300,000, I'm selling my house. That's a victory. And that's thanks to every institution and every group that have passed through our space and, 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 and help us out with, uh, with, uh, with education and, 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 and empowerment. Uh, so since cada taller, eh, arreglar una puerta es una victoria. <laughs> eh, cada taller que hemos dado, cada gente que, que ha, aprendi ha aprendido desde ahí a bregar con su huerto o están aprendiendo eh, eh, a bregar con su huerto en su casa. Eh, talleres de empoderamiento a la comunidad para amar más a su comunidad, a su espacio, en vez de pensar en vender, es una victoria. Y todo eso es una victoria y pues, Eh, una de las dificultades de las muchas que seguimos teniendo, pero una de ellas la, la, la dificultad a veces para lograr eh, cosas por las obvias razones. El, la, el gobierno y la institución pues es un poco complejo a veces para lograr simplemente un permiso o, o cosas básicas que igual, como mencioné, pasan, eh, se, tradu se, se, se traducen allá en Estados Unidos también, como ir a sacar la licencia a conducir. A, al DMV es eh, una pejiguera en cualquier estado de Estados Unidos. No hay tecnología que, que te salve de, de meterte una par de horas ahí esperando. Sí, pero sí, eso. Awesome. Um, 
Um, así que ahora vivimos en un mundo donde tenemos políticos y movimientos conservadores que están promulgando leyes para burlarnos, ¿verdad? ¿Qué papel juega su trabajo para evitar que eso suceda? So we live in a world where we have politicians and conservative movements who are putting legislation in place to erase us. What role do your work play, or does your work play in preventing that from happening? Let's start with Elon. So one of the conversations that came up that during the descendant convening last week that I wish we had more time uh, to, to really get serious about was this, um, the fact that we, the African descendants don't have our own version of what we call NAGPRA, which was the, um, okay, I'm hearing people know what that is, okay. So um, there is no national legal, there's no laws that African descendants can use to demand access to our ancestors' bones or historic places. Um, so you have to use, so without those laws, you have to use social pressure and community organizing. Um, and frankly, indigenous folks, even with NAGPRA, you still have to use the social pressure and organizing, but there's no uh, legal mechanism to help support you. So um, what's kind of the first thing that, that popped up into my head, there is a group of black archeologists um, that are scattered around the country, I think they're mostly in South Carolina, I think, that have been starting to do some work around that, but it's still a very, it's a movement within its infancy that I think um, our descendants can really help support. Um, but, What I always go back to is this article I read, I don't know, like a decade ago. It was about a politician in Chicago who told people, oh yeah, I'm doing things for black people, I'm doing things for black people. And a black community came up, member came up to him and said, yeah, but you told us in your campaign you were gonna do this and you were gonna do that and you haven't been doing it. What's the problem? And the politician said, make me. And then he whispered on the side, no, seriously, I want to do these things, but the people above me, the people with money, don't want me to do those things. You want me to do it? You have to publicly make me do it. And then I can do what I actually want to do, which is to help you. So that's actually what I keep in mind. And sometimes it's also what I tell other folks. Um, I'm an African descendant, but I work for a white institution and I recognize the history of the institution. And there are certain things that in some cases I'm not allowed to say or it's really difficult for me to do without possibly risking my ability to pay for my children's future education. So sometimes I've had to whisper, whisper to people on the side, make me get a group together build a coalition, I'm ready to support you, I will send all the resources I can in your direction to do it, but I may not be able to publicly do something until you make me. So that is really an advice that I give to anyone who is interested in engaging with historic sites. Don't wait and make them. Make them listen to you and to your ancestors And the more people you bring together in collaboration and community, the faster, the better you'll be able to do it. Um, so, uh, what we have, uh, we, we live, our local situation, um, and this is happening all over also United States, for our local situation, based on laws um, and legislation and, and that give uh, easy access and, and uh, no tax and all these laws in place that have bring incredible amount of people mm -hmm. 
with incredible amounts of money to this country to buy our land and our houses and, <coughs> our, and, uh, and dis uh, destroy our communities that are in their own way for their own gain and benefit. Um, that also is happening in the United States after the pandemic specifically, that um, people were shifting and bringing their, 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 their rent incredibly higher for those other folks that were living there, uh, been living there or uh, before. Um, and uh, that uh, have, have affects us incredible. That's a law that uh, was put in place and have changed in many ways of name and, and add some things here and there, but it's the same law that is this, 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 uh, uh, kicking us out of our own country. Mm -hmm. And what our project has done, or part of, or, or one of our efforts collectively with a, another group, which is Ayuda Legal PR, uh, is to educate mm -hmm. our community when it comes to that. So answering to your question, that's uh, or out of the top of my head, like the first you know, thing is to, because the law is there. Yeah. And you know, when you offer people money, people, you know, it's, sort of, it's, it's surprising that my house costs what? <laughs> you know? So Loisa is a, within the metro, metro area, Luisa is the closest to it, is right next to the airport, right next to Isla Verde. But, uh, I mean, Luisa is incredibly rich. Everybody wants a piece of Luisa, right? And it's easy because for years, our community has continued to be seen as a violent one, mm -hmm. which bring the price of the property down. And, but now with this loss in place and stuff, people are starting, uh, not starting, continue now with laws that help them mm -hmm. to come in and to take our space. So that, that, those workshops that we have specifically there and also the deal with the land and, 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 and reimagining that your patio, back patio, can be just like your great grandmother had it with some yuca, with some plantain, with some other fruits. Um, that thing I think, I, I believe, that those two workshops specifically right now give the tools and strength for people to want to uh, uh, maintain uh, and, and, and fight uh, uh, by nature the, uh, you know, the, the, the loss that uh, affects us. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so I just want to tee it up if we start a little late, so I could empezamos un poquito tarde, pero I have one more question, and after that, if someone has a question, please prepare yourself to ask the question. Um, but the last question is, how would, will this program or project or movement, however you want to define it, how will this look in 10 years? And what kind of impact are you hoping to have? So, como será este programa, proyecto dentro de 10 años? Y qué tipo de impacto espera tener? Let's start with you. So, <clears throat> I have a 11-month-old baby and a almost three-year-old. And when people call me and say, oh, you know, I'm traveling to this state or that state, and I want to go to a historic site. And oh, I hear about this historic site in my community. Should I go visit it? And if it's a historic site with a history of slavery, I do a quick Google. And I usually say, no, don't go there. I, in 10 years, I want, number one, all national trust sites, all national trust sites with, with histories of slavery especially to be sites where I would feel comfortable with my children being taken on a school field trip there and I don't have to go. Mm. And I don't have to be there running behind the class going, no, that's not correct, that's not correct. <laughs> nope, don't, don't, nope, that was not, that's not true. And 
are you gonna tell this story about X, Y, and Z and the enslaved woman who did this thing? Um, I want to be able to trust that my children can go to any historic place in America and hear the actual truth and hear it told, hear the truth told in a way that is empowering and not disempowering. Because you can talk about violent histories in age appropriate ways and in ways that leave the child knowing that they can live a better life, that they can make different choices than were made in the past, and that can help them feel good about themselves as they leave, feeling like they have wrestled with something and they are gaining something that they can use in the future. I deeply believe that. And most historic places are unable to do that right now. So it's something that they are working on and with the Engaging Descendants rubric, I'm seeing this happening, this work being done, and I'm seeing little glimpses at a lot of places now that I'm very, very excited about. But right now, it's all about making sure that adults can visit and leave feeling like they have learned the truth. That is like the number one thing we're trying to make sure we're getting done at all of our sites that adults are learning it. Um, the children, we still have more work to do, but it's, it's a field-wide problem. It's an education problem across the country. So it's, it's not just us, but um, it has to be a movement because it has to be something that helps everybody because my children are your children, your children are my children. I don't wanna hoard all the good things just for my kids. I wanna make sure that when your kids come to my site, when you come to my site, that you are cared for and as loved as I would ensure for mine. So it's something that we're still working on, but I'm seeing a lot of promise. And in the work of uh, bringing descendants together and empowering descendants and linking them up with the historic places where their ancestors were enslaved so they can make these big collective demands for better interpretation and having people in place, like we're doing all this new hiring. And we've got some folks who have been at these sites for a while who just didn't feel empowered to make some of the necessary changes until the last few years. So there's been a lot of really exciting things happening that um, they're getting this work done a lot better. And then as more descendants are getting involved, I know that we're on the right track. So I think there's a lot. Oh, and so not only do we have our very first <coughs> African descendant as a senior <laughs> vice president and as director of interpretation and education, we have the very first African descendant who is the di executive director of one of our sites of enslavement. So this is really, really important because this is a historic site that is um, a former, sh the big house of the former sugar plantation. So um, everything that he's gonna be doing over the following years is what we would love to be seeing at the former sugar plantations all throughout Puerto Rico. So there's gonna be a lot of back and forth there going on and um, we're really proud that we're able to do that. Yeah, I was just mentioning Ethan that Loisa, right in our river, uh, we had a sugar plantation and a lot of the workers used to cross from Puerto Rancón and go to Canoanas and come back. Yeah, they had a sugar plantation really near us. Um, I think that's all good there. We'll, we'll talk about it. Um, so yeah, uh, how, how do I see El Ancón our project in 10 years? Well, um, continue strong, continue bringing more workshop, continue building uh, making more links and connection between us uh, working all over, you know, the our, you know, uh, Caribbean and the, the states, mm -hmm. right? Because we're doing the same work. Yeah. Uh, 
and also South America, like La Cumbre in, uh, in Central America is full because of that. Like you get to meet people from everywhere uh, doing the same work from their spaces. But for me, um, yeah, continue making links, continue working uh, strong to, to build up, uh, really looking forward to uh, be able to build uh, in the house um, the museum if that uh, 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 solicit, so, um, uh, the submission goes through so people can see the history there and eternally uh, with images and voice like we're we're writing it we wrote it down and it's we're, it's really 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 exciting um, and and other stuff uh, that I see in the future but uh, that is is I cannot share it too much <laughs> but are really positive and and will make justice and uh, to our ancestors and to all that um, sacrifice that for years uh, our family and our community have gone through. So, sí, veo un futuro brillante, mucho trabajo, eh, esperando que el proyecto de la solicitud para el, para para el espacio museo se nos dé. Eh, y viendo, viendo muchas futuras colaboraciones con nuestro Caribe, con Sudamérica, con Estados Unidos y toda esta gente que desde sus espacios está luchando por esa misma equidad racial y reconocimiento y respeto. Este, porque pues ya, ya está bueno, ¿no? Dice, ¿no? <laughs> so, sí, eso es. Bueno. Yo no sé si tenemos tiempo para preguntas. Sí, hay, hay preguntas, let's go. No, no tenemos micrófono, hay que tener un mic. Porque yo, yo quiero que, que te oyen en YouTube Land. Gracias. Gracias por el panel. Um, I, have, I have three questions, <laughs> but I will try to make them fast. One is if you could share an example of uh, how uh, a violent history like slavery can be um, conveyed in empowering ways for young kids, if you have seen, you know, just share one example. And then um, the also how do you change expectations of visitors um, to be able to deal with uh, information that is uncomfortable, and how do you make I, how do you convince them that this is something important, even though they're going to feel uncomfortable? And then the last thing is just the rubric. I really, uh, I'm really curious, and if you could just say the whole name of the rubric so that we can find slowly, so that I can write it down and find it on the internet. Huh? <laughs> ah, okay, okay. So the rubric is the, it's very long, <laughs> engaging descendants in the interpretation of slavery for historic sites and museums. I think it's the, I feel like I'm missing part of it. Descendant the engaging descendant communities in the interpretation of slavery for historic sites and museums. That's it. Um, I might see if I can Google it and put it up there. But, oh, oh. Um, I don't know if Oh, okay. okay. Um, but then she's asking about how do you deal with the kids. So um, I have two favorite examples that are quick. Um, the first one actually comes from a previous position where I was director of a small historic house in Massachusetts. And we had a very strong women's history um, narratives at that site. And the house was 500 square feet really small, so about the size of a very tiny one-room apartment. And it had an attic space that um, was the same general dimensions of um, the attic space that um, a woman named Harriet Jacobs lived in for seven years uh, during slavery. So um, Harriet Jacobs was a young woman in South Carolina who, sorry, North Carolina, who um, 
had been under a rather constant threat of sexual violence starting at around 13 or 14 years old, coming from her enslaver. And in order, she came up with every possible strategy she could to protect herself since her parents had died and she was kind of alone. She didn't have, she didn't have any legal protection and she had very little social protection too. And so um, one of her strategies was to actually connect with a young white lawyer in the community. And she had hoped by creating a relationship with this man, he would protect her from another man. Long story short, she went on to have two children as a teenager with this man who promised that he would free their children. Um, he didn't, but he allowed those children to go live with her grandmother. Harriet ends up uh, running away several times to escape her enslaver's advances, and the only place she was able to find where she could feel safe was in her grandmother's attic, so in an attic crawl space that was about three feet high and seven feet across. So she could sit up, but she could not stand, and she could lay down flat. Uh, you know, North Carolina, 1800s, no heat, um, no air conditioning, no windows, so just cracks in the walls uh, for air and ventilation. And she lived there for seven years in order to protect herself physically from her enslaver's constant sexual violence, threats of sexual violence, um, before eventually being able to escape and then literally steal her own children. So I tell that story because um, I was able to do a pop-up exhibition for high school students where we actually spent some time talking about sexual violence because just because we like to think that children don't know anything about sex doesn't mean that they don't know anything and doesn't mean that they haven't already been under threat of sexual violence just like Harriet Jacobs had been starting around 13 or 14 years old. So um, we spent some time talking in age appropriate ways about how to protect yourself um, and then also what to do if you are under threat or experience sexual violence. Um, we did that in collaboration with teachers and we talked about parents. Um, and we told the story of Harry Jacobs, how she tried going to her grandmother, how she tried going to white women in the community for support, how she, we, she tried to go to white men in the community for support all the different ways that she tried to strategize for her own protection and her children's protection. And then um, we also put together a list of intellectual and physical demands that come up throughout Harriet's narrative. And then we use that to talk to the students or, or use that to help the students explore how to create their own list of demands for intellectual and physical autonomy. So um, it's talking about violence, but in a way that is intended to help the students think deeply, understand the past, but how they can be empowered through the stories and experiences of the past. And my other quick story is from um, our historic sites, uh, Shadows on the Tesh, where we now have a black director, where one of the stories that they have is about a man who stole himself, his wife, his children and weapons and escaped into the swamps and was able to fend off his enslavers using shotguns and pistols um, for a time before he eventually, that we know of, escapes the record. So we actually don't know what happens to him. All we, and that's really just because of who's keeping track of the records. In all likelihood, he's able to find his way probably to New Orleans in Louisiana and um, find some kind of safety, maybe changing his name, changing the family's names. Um, or at least that's the empowered, that's the way I imagine um, what happened to him. 
So that's a story that we might tell children to help them think about uh, how you can, once again, find ways to get your own physical autonomy and make demands for your own self and advocate for yourself and your family and for your loved ones, even if that's what not what others would want for you. Mm -hmm. And then also what I would like to do for the student or for, for the students to do is to look at how our historic site has traditionally interpreted that story and then think for themselves of how would you narrate based on the primary sources we have. How would you tell that family's story in a way that you would want your own ancestor's story told? So comparing and contrasting how we've traditionally told it, and then maybe that'll be our way of telling that story going forward. We would use how a student has narrated that story. Sí, buenas tardes. Eh, ¿Usted no habla nada de español? Bueno, pero habla un poco. Yo podría hablar inglés, pero es, es un inglés, es broken English, so I better you know, speak in Spanish. Este, es muy interesante este, su, su esperanza de que usted pueda enviar a sus hijos a estos sites este, de que no le enseñen la historia equivocada o incorrecta a esos hijos o a esos descendientes. Yo, lamentablemente, no tengo esperanza porque todo el sistema educativo de los Estados Unidos está fundamentado en justificar todos los crímenes que ha cometido los gobiernos de los Estados Unidos, la Marina, el Ejército, la Fuerza Aérea y todo el aparato eh, armamentista de los Estados Unidos. Eh, no tengo esperanza porque mientras la sociedad estadounidense pueda estar eh, eligiendo individuos como Donald Trump, esté eligiendo congresistas como los muchos racistas que hay en el Senado y la Cámara de Representantes de los Estados Unidos, mientras pueda estar eligiendo gobernadores como de Santis en la Florida y como los muchos racistas que hay todavía en los Estados Unidos, mientras la policía de los Estados Unidos sea el aparato represivo, el nuevo sistema de linchamiento de los Estados Unidos, de verdad que no tengo esperanza. Y eso porque la historia nos enseña que es escrita por los vencedores. Ahora mismo hay una lucha en los Estados Unidos, que ustedes que viven allá la, la conocen, es derribar todos los símbolos de la Confederación de los Estados Unidos. Mire, nosotros somos tan ignorantes, ahora mismo pasando por ahí, por una calle entrando aquí a, a Río Piedra, Veo una bandera ondeando de la Confederación de los Estados Unidos. No se entera la gente y siguen perpetrando los símbolos de opresión, de discriminación y de todas las barbaridades que han cometido con nosotros. Le deseo suerte, pero yo no tengo ninguna esperanza. Mientras el sistema de parques nacionales, parques públicos, sea parte del gobierno de los Estados Unidos, no espero absolutamente nada. Aquí mismo en Puerto Rico, el morro, 
el castillo de San Cristóbal. Cuando yo fui, lo único que había con relación a los antepasados nuestros era un, una muestra de un líquido que se utilizaba para caballos, para este, que se utilizaba también contra los esclavizados. Nadie nos dice aquí, por ejemplo, que la familia de los gobernadores tienen todavía que se va allí a la Casa Blanca, tiene un roto en el suelo donde duermen, donde dormían los esclavizados de la familia. Nadie nos dice aquí que en el Museo de San Juan, que era la plaza del mercado de San Juan, era donde se vendían los esclavos. Nadie nos dice aquí que en el Castillo Serrayé, allí lincharon a 23 revoltoso porque estaban luchando contra la esclavitud. Nosotros, lamentablemente, hasta que, nos, hasta que nosotros no tomemos el poder por asalto, por asalto, nosotros no vamos a realizar ese sueño que usted tiene. Muchas gracias. He appreciates your hope that you have in terms of your description of bringing your kids and I asked you the question about how it looks 10 years from now. He, without a doubt, unequivocally does not have any hope for a list of reasons, including racist government, militarization, how we use our military, how we have um, elected racist individuals like Donald Trump, DeSantis, and others. Um, he also went on to talk about how the agencies, like the National Park Service, have been complicit and used the example of El Morro right here, which is the San Juan National Historic Site, which is a world UNESCO site, which gets a big, makes a big deal for a lot of people here, but how they do not talk about the truth around um, enslavement at those sites, um, including La Fortaleza and those places where the governor lived and all those places which all connected along the same uh, historic buildings in Old San Juan. Um, so, so inevitably, he does not have any hope, right? What I would say in response very simply is, I cannot do this work without having hope. It's absolutely impossible for me to move forward with this work without having some element of hope. I understand the trajectory of racism and discrimination is story. There is no argument against that. It would be impossible for me to rebuke anything that was said. It was all correct. But in order for me to move forward, I have to, I have, to have some hope for my, my family. I also have children who I know will have children someday, and I have to continue to do this fight in order for that to happen. There are systemic issues that we're all working through. Uh, many of them are not resolved. I think they're still, we're still in a place where we're creating awareness around those issues so that we can position ourselves to dismantle these structures to then come up with new solutions. So these structures were not fortified overnight. They will not be dismantled overnight. I think this is the work of people who have to have patience and long suffering and coalition building because we can't do this work in isolation. I always rip off a lot of my work from the 60s, from the Black Panthers and the Young Lords, which were internationalists in their activism. So if I care about what's happening in the Southeast DC, I gotta care about what's happening in Acostia, I care about what's happening in Harlem, I care what's happening in Watts, I care about what's happening in Palestine, and I definitely care about what's happening in Puerto Rico, right? We have to do it that way. We have to do it that way. It has to be a network of activism. But if we continue to isolate our activism and our efforts, what he said is going to be inevitably true. I'm going to echo what Omar said about, about hope in that I love people 
I love humanity, and all of my work would be pointless if I didn't have hope. And I have certainly felt hopeless. Uh, <laughs> I have certainly felt like I am, um, what's his name, pushing the boulder up the hill just constantly. Sisyphus, Sisyphus, just constantly pushing the boulder up. Sometimes it rolls over me and I'm crushed and I have to get back up, shake it back off and go push again. Um, before my children were born, I was doing it for my nieces and nephews, um, for my other beloved children in my life. And now I'm doing it for my kids. I have a hope that some historic places will be ready by the time my children are 10 and 13. I do not have hope that all of them. But there are certain places where I know even today I can let them go. And my work is to force more sites to be able to do that. I understand what you're saying about the Park Service. Um, UNESCO's done a lot of amazing work, but a lot of our big credentialing institutions do not insist on equity. They do not insist on engagement with descendants of slavery, with indigenous peoples. They don't insist on it. So it's, it goes back to that make me, you know? Um, so we have to force the institutions, big and small, and there's a variety of strategies that I've been using with the sites that I work with and sites you know, outside of our portfolio when I'm doing more of my activist work um, outside of our organization. But a lot of it is forcing the truth telling, shining the light, that's why our little working groups are called Rise and Shine. It's all about exposing the truth, shining that light, and forcing people to wake up to what's always been there. So um, I hope that you will find a sense of hope that even if it's not for everything, that it's a, a single place that is much loved by you, that you can concentrate your hope on, because concentrating it on all of them is, yeah, it's, it's overwhelming. Um, so I have my little places that are kind of my little babies that I focus on and that I really, really believe in and I know we can make some changes. And then I just keep pushing until something happens. <coughs> Sometimes that means People have to move on outside of the institution, um, but we have to keep pushing them. We have to make them change. Déjame decirte que yo tengo mucho respeto for what he just said, man. Like that comes from wisdom. That ain't just come from nowhere. Right, so I got a lot of respect for that. But in closing, I will share with you my favorite new quote from Dr. Cornell West. And I think it's appropriate in, in the way that we close here this, this afternoon, that justice is what love looks like in public. Right? La justicia es como se ve el amor en público. And with that, I want to say thank you for coming.
Eh, arte práctico, ¿verdad? No, es eh, Bellas Artes. Ahora en Bella, desde las 5 de la tarde abre la exhibición Contemplaciones en Bellas Artes. Desde las 5, Contemplaciones en Bellas Artes. En, en Bellas Artes. Bellas Artes. La Facultad de Bellas Artes, sí. Contemplaciones, sí. Habrá desde, desde las 5.